the 20th meeting of this year of the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee. Uh, before we go ahead, remind you to turn off your electronic equipment, apart from those who are using tablets for the purposes of this meeting. Uh, agenda item one is a decision on taking business in private, and the committee will, should decide whether to take items four and five, consideration of its letters to the Scottish Government on res resource use and the circular economy, and on the Land Reform Review Group final report in private. Are we agreed? Yeah. We are agreed. Uh, thank you. Um, the agenda item two is subordinate legislation. The second item today is for the committee to consider the following negative instruments. Plant Health Scotland Amendment Order 2012, SSI 20, sorry, 2014, SSI 2014 and Specified Diseases Notification and Slaughter Amendment and Compensation Scotland Order 2014, SSI 2014 151. Members should note that no motion to annul has been received in relation to these SSIs. I refer members to the paper and ask if there's any, is there any comment now? There are no comments. Um, if the committee has agreed, they do not wish to make any recommendations in relation to these instruments. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Thank you. We move to agenda item three, public petition PE01490. Third item today is for the committee to take evidence from the Minister uh, for Environment and Climate Change in a petition to control uh, wild geese numbers. The petition was lodged by Patrick Krause on behalf of the Scottish Crofting Federation. And I welcome uh, the Minister. Um, good morning to you, Paul Wheelhouse. And you can introduce your officials and I invite you to make any opening remarks that you require to. Thank you, Convener. Uh, I have to my right Eileen Stewart, who's Head of Policy and Advice at SNH, and I've got Andrew Taylor from the Scottish Government, who advises me on uh, matters such as deer management and goose management. So, uh, if I may, I'll just make, give my opening remarks, Convener. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to address the committee and, and describe some of the work the Government is taking forward in relation to supporting protected goose populations and managing the impact of geese on crofting and agriculture, uh, often on islands or in coastal areas, of course. First of all, I would like to emphasise the conservation success that uh, goose management has provided over the years, with populations of some species recovering from dangerously low levels. Goose management is a complex issue and uh, clearly sometimes a contentious one, uh, which is why we seek to maintain dialogue and consensus through stakeholder groups, and in particular, the National Goose Management Review Group, or NGMRG, um, the group is chaired by Scottish Government and supported by SNH. Its members include farming, crofting, sporting and conservation interests. And I recognise geese can, in certain areas and at certain times, uh, cause serious agricultural damage. Serious impacts tend to be localised in particular areas, such as on Isla, uh, but there is also a general level of goose uh, impact associated with the movement of migratory species, such as parts of Caithness. Um, local goose management schemes are the principal mechanism to support geese and agriculture. Isla was the first scheme and is the largest by far, uh, but there are others on the Solway, uh, Kintyre, Strathbeg, South Walls and Orkney, and these are funded by SNH. From 2010 until this year, uh, the two schemes on the Ewes and Tyrian Call have been funded under the Macker Life Scheme, uh, with wider objectives relating to preserving traditional cereal production and so supporting biodiversity of other bird species. Um, goose management was an important aspect of that to prevent uh, damage to these cereals and the, the goose control uh, latter two schemes continue as adaptive management trials which I will come to shortly. There was some discussion over whether the SRDP could be used to help fund goose management schemes. Uh, the group looked at this uh, and stakeholders were pretty unanimous in that they felt the SRDP would not be a suitable vehicle uh, to deliver this funding. Uh, but I'm happy to discuss that further, uh, Convener. I know you're interested in that. Uh, and this was due to the competitive nature of the scheme, the existing budgetary pressures and the localised nature of goose impact. So goose management remains funded uh, directly via SNH and £1.2 million per annum is directed to supporting farmers and crofters in managing geese. 
uh, goose management policy has evolved over the years and the National Goose Group has had a, a dual role in overseeing local schemes and advising ministers on national policy. The policy is reviewed periodically, most recently in 2010. And, and goose management policy has for some time been guided by three high-level objectives. Uh, firstly, to meet the UK's nature conservation obligations. Uh, secondly, to minimise the economic loss to farmers. And thirdly, to maximise the value of money of public expenditure. The government response to the 2010 review welcomed the report, particularly the recognition that goose management schemes had been a conservation success and that the local approach should be continued. We also recognise the challenges in relation to a few vulnerable species, such as Greenland white-fronted uh, geese on Isla, and the coverage of the schemes in certain areas and the issues around rising costs. Finally, uh, undertook to, uh, the study undertook to pursue an adaptive management approach in relation to geese, and I'll describe some of this work next. Over the last two years, SNH has been developing adaptive management pilots designed to prevent serious agricultural damage on Scottish islands from resident greylag geese. Pilots are running on Orkney, uh, the Ewes, Tyree and Col, and a Lewis and Harris scheme is due to start this year. Uh, the pilots have been developed with local input and have been generally welcomed by local crofters and farmers, and they differ in design due to local conditions. SNH have used the powers available to them in legislation to license a limited sale of wild goose carcasses arising from the pilots. Uh, the general prohibition on the sale of meat from wild geese was introduced for conservation reasons, and we recognise the concerns of certain stakeholders in weakening those controls. Uh, however, we believe there are sufficient safeguards in place to allow the sale in these cases, and the move has been a success. Finally, ministers announced in 2012 that SNH would examine how to develop an adaptive management approach to goose management on Isla. Uh, clearly, this is a very controversial step, and I have assured stakeholders that we would only proceed with these measures if we were certain that this could be done in a manner compliant with domestic and European legal obligations. The Isla project is ongoing, and SNH is in the process of consulting interested parties on the draft strategy. Part of this work includes consulting EU member states on international aspects of managing migratory goose populations. Uh, and in closing, uh, convener, in summary, I, I just think we can agree that we are dealing with a complex and contentious issue and that there is no one-size-fits-all approach uh, or solution for managing geese. We also value discussion and consultation and seek to maintain a consensus where we can. And this has been a necessarily brief description of the work uh, we are involved in, uh, but obviously happy to take any questions the committee may have. Thank you, Minister, for that. Um, I'd like to kick off, and we want to try and, if possible, although we know that the flocks get mixed, to keep the questions separate uh, with regard to the migratory species and those of the resident population, uh, because that allows us to focus, for a start, on Isla, uh, and before we move on to the wider discussion about grey lags. Um, do you have a view on the sustainable number of barnacle geese on Isla? Well, this is clearly something that a uh, considerable amount of effort is going into to studying, uh, convener. What I would say is that we have uh, a knowledge that in Scotland we have about 65,000 uh, barnacle green and barnacle geese. Uh, now that constitutes a very high percentage of the world's population of Greenland barnacle geese. So we recognise we have a responsibility uh, to uh, the international community to manage that population sensitively, uh, while obviously taking account of the agricultural impact it has. So we are reasonably confident in terms of the numbers because of the work that goes into monitoring uh, the take of, of birds through lethal, scaring the bag limit, as it's called, uh, on Isla, and the particular mechanisms there are to make sure that uh, there's a count, accurate count of how many are, 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 are indeed killed um, uh, and the resident population that uh, Goose numbers on Isla in terms of barnacle geese uh, are, uh, are coming back down again. We believe we have a total of 46,500 geese of all species on Isla in the current year, which is a reduction from the previous year. So the suggestion is it's slightly over 40,000 barnacle geese at this point in time. Which is much larger than it was um, in uh, previous in, decades indeed. in the information that we have. So we're reaching a point where we are hosting in those areas uh, the largest number of these uh, birds that there have been seen in the time of our records, am I correct? 
Yes, I mean, if, if it would help the committee, I can give some figures just to our, our yep. understanding. And this is, I should stress, on seasonal average figures, so the uh, average numbers throughout the whole season for barnacle geese uh, have risen uh, from about uh, a low point in, in the period I have in front of me of 2001 or about 33,452 barnacle geese uh, to 46,000. 903 by 2012-13. There was a peak pre prior to that before numbers came down slightly. We believe the numbers are lower than that now, uh, near 40,000. Uh, it's not possible to say exactly why they've come down in, in the past year. Uh, there may be things happening elsewhere in their range in Greenland, uh, but obviously uh, we'll be investigating to what extent the, uh, the activity that we undertook in the last 12 months has helped disperse the population. And the question about dispersal obviously is important because there's, if there's a displacement effect, then other areas are, are being affected by barnacle geese in particular. Yeah, that's true, Convener. If we remove the geese from Isla, then they potentially go to other parts of their natural range. Yes. Um, we talked about better data there for a minute. Um, uh, are you happy that our figures are robust? Um, how well are we collating? The information, for example, when they're shot, uh, and what uh, would you suggest were the means whereby we improve that data? Well, I, in an Isla convener, uh, we're reasonably confident of the numbers are, are accurate because of the legal requirements that affect an annex one species. There's quite uh, strict monitoring of the numbers that are. Uh, taken. As I say, each year we, we set a, a, a bag limit, um, a, a limit to the number that can be lethally scared or uh, euthanized, um, and that is then divided up into individual farmers, so they have a specific allocation. They then have to a legal duty to report in terms of how many they actually take, and, not, and it's worth saying that all not always is the case that the full bag limit is actually taken. Um, it has been the case in previous years where they've actually fell below what had actually been set. Um, but because of that requirement, uh, we are then able to collate the data and understand to what extent there has been a, uh, a number taken that, that particular year. But I can maybe invite either Eileen or, or Andrew, I'm not sure who would prefer, maybe Andrew would be the best person to take this, in terms of the, uh, the ongoing monitoring of, of, of the numbers. The counts are very good on Isla. There's very good information available on Isla, as well as, uh, uh, you know, there is, I think, monthly counting in, in relation to uh, payments under the ILA local goose management scheme. So information is very good on ILA. It would be fair to say, convener, we, we do have data for other populations of geese, grey lag, um, uh, other species. Uh, I would say ILA is probably the best quality data we have of all the populations uh, under study. It was put to us that uh, there could be a better collation of those figures for grey lag geese. Without, you know, which get mixed up in the same flocks as barnacles, we understand. But that tends to be less of a problem in Isla than on other islands. We, but we, how much less of a problem? I mean, is the grey lag problem increasing in Isla as well? There, there was some. I, I visited Isla last last year, convener, and certainly heard some anecdotal evidence that grey lag numbers were were, some, were still modest, but they had been increasing. Uh, there's also, uh, just to give you a, a, a sense of the dynamics here, that uh, grey lag geese seem to learn quite well from, from what's actually happening in terms of the scaring activity. And they are, um, from what I've been told, I didn't observe this myself, but what I'm told by local farmers uh, and indeed uh, those colleagues from SNH uh, and Scottish Government who are with me, that they are uh, finding themselves uh, moving towards the Greenland white fronts, because you know, the Greenland white fronts aren't being... Uh, tackled by the lethal scaring activity and moving away sometimes from, from hanging with the, uh, the barnacle geese who are being uh, targeted for, for action. So uh, I suppose I was, I, was, I was joking about the point earlier on with colleagues, but you know, when you hang with the crows, you get shot with the crows. And uh, I think the um, uh, grey lag geese are smart enough to realise that they should stick with the green and white fronts. Uh, but they, the numbers are modest in Isla. They had much more substantial grey lag numbers in Orkney, uh, where there's been a significant issue, and we, we had to take uh, uh, additional action on adaptive management with the support of the uh, members of the National Goose Management Re uh, Review Group uh, to, to do that. Um, but the numbers are uh, difficult to monitor, even in Orkney, because much of the activity on the mainland is on the Orkney mainland. And we believe that some grey lags may have been dispersed to surrounding islands in the archipelago. Uh, and we need to improve our understanding exactly how many have, have moved. 
Well, indeed, we, we perhaps come on to some of the things to do with grey lags in a minute or two. But, uh, Claudia Beamish. Thank you very much, Kavina. Uh, good morning, Minister, and, and to, to both of you as well. Uh, could I just ask, in relation to mixed flocks, whether, um, which, which you have um, begun to outline already, Minister, but in terms of the, um, the mix on Isla, the, um, as I understand it, the, um, the barnacle do still mix with the threatened green, green and white fronted uh, geese. And uh, just in terms of um, the, what was highlighted by the RSPB, um, whether there is any form of risk assessment um, being done or likely to be done in relation to the Habitats Directive as to what the implications of that could be, bearing in mind that there are, there are global implications. Well, the first thing to say is we uh, remain concerned about the, the future of the green and white front geese on Isla. They, their numbers have not been uh, holding up well, and uh, they have, uh, whether that's down to competition for feed with other species or whether there are other factors at play, climatic change, uh, or indeed issues to do with their, their, their um, uh, other grounds that they're on in Greenland and elsewhere, uh, it's impossible to say. You are right, though, um, uh, sorry, uh, Claudia Beamish is right, that, uh, that green and white fronts do mix with barnacle geese, which makes it all more difficult to actually target action on the barnacles when you're trying to uh, in, employ scaring uh, uh, behaviours to try and move them off of ground because you're also affecting the green and white fronts. There is some suggestion, from what I've been told uh, by those who are, are expert in this issue, that uh, there are some types of uh, ground which are preferred by green and white fronts that barnacles don't like. So if you could encourage more habitat of that kind, it would, it would help the green and white fronts. It would allow you to split off the green and white fronts from the barnacle geese and therefore have more impact in terms of your uh, adaptive management process on, on the barnacle numbers. Uh, but we're clearly, in the, in the course of developing a dossier of what we are doing, we have to demonstrate to the Commission that we're treating very sensitively both uh, the impact on barnacles, but also particularly the green and white fronts, which are, uh, from the period when the, the, the schemes were last reviewed, green and, white ones, green and white fronts were flagged up as the major conservation concern and it was agreed that more activity would be targeted to helping them in the future. So it's something we have very much got in mind that we have to continue to monitor, but I believe Eileen wants to, to come in on this point too. Um, just to provide some reassurance, um, when we design the schemes before they're uh, set up and running, we undertake a habitats regulations assessment, which does look at all of the species of, of conservation interest, which obviously includes green and white fronts, and have to go through an analysis to make sure that any of the management measures that we're putting in place, including scaring and lethal scaring, won't have an adverse impact on the green and white fronts. And so one of the measures that's put in place is that when... Um, people are given licenses to shoot uh, barnacle geese, they can only use those when green and white fronts aren't in the same field. So people on the ground are very aware of the need to target the effort at barnacles and, and are very aware of the special you know, concern that we have on, on green and white fronts. And as the minister said, we are looking at more ways that we can undertake management specifically to support green and white fronts and to try and separate, separate out their sort of habitat um, diversification to allow that management to be more sort of um, targeted. But could I come back briefly on the, uh, the more broadly, Minister, in terms of the, the management plan for the future in, in Isla, whether you do have any concerns about what's been highlighted by um, conservation groups about the feeling that they might not have been involved in, in those structures for taking forward the, the stakeholder views? And I wondered if you had any comment on that. Well, I mean, I, I, I've had a number of quite lengthy discussions with RSPB. I mean, I went out to, to Isla myself. I went to visit the RSPB reserve there. Um, we've, we've always been open to a uh, dialogue with, with the RSPB, and indeed they're involved in the National Goose Management uh, Review Group, as our WWT, I think. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, you know, the conservation groups have, have an interest, and, and I would just say if there are other groups that have a desire to be involved and then to, to communicate that to us but I've not been made aware by anybody so far saying we don't feel we're being involved in this. Um, I'm certainly aware of the concerns RSPB have about the, the approach but I, I believe they have been well consulted and indeed I've invited RSPB to, in the case of the ILA uh, situation, to bring forward their own suggestions uh, if they have any of, of, of how we can 
perhaps manage the habitat along the lines that Eileen and, uh, and myself have been just discussing how we can manage the habitat to try and provide either more sacrificial feeding areas for geese um, uh, using l underused land, maybe neglected land, um, which might be suitable, or, or other approaches that they can, they can bring forward. So I certainly would welcome any suggestions they have. Okay, I was going to mention about management methods now. Um, Andrew Bauer from NFUS um, brandished a report which he said was about to become active in Isla. Um, when can we expect to see uh, that uh, published so that we can understand the implications of their proposals for management, adaptive management? Well, I, I will invite um, maybe Eileen to comment on the report, Convener. Uh, it's, it's an ongoing uh, study we are uh, we gave a commitment um, in the run-in to my visit to Tyler and indeed subsequently that we would work with local stakeholders to try and identify a strategy for adaptive management that um, would be working in sympathy with our, uh, our obligations under the Habitats Directive and Birds Directive and also uh, you know, in, in trying to manage the serious agricultural damage that I saw for myself when I was there. And to put things in perspective, we have you know, uh, when I was uh, Mr. Craig Archibald's farm, um, uh, I visited, uh, saw one field with two to 3,000 geese in it, uh, and they were feeding very voraciously, uh, I have to say. Uh, so it's, it, there's definitely, you know, quite clear evidence of impact at a local level. Uh, but the study is, is ongoing. We have to identify, one thing we do have to understand is, uh, we've just seen this recent drop that I've, I've, I discussed earlier on in, in goose numbers. We need to understand to what extent that is uh, a response to something happening outside of Scotland, uh, whether it's something to, as a response to the adaptive management we're already doing in terms of the, um, the, the, the legitimate lethal scaring activity that's, that's authorised through the bag limit, uh, and understand, because it, it's finely balanced, we have to be sure that the limit that we've set each year is not threatening the conservation status of the species. And so there's work going on on that basis, but perhaps Eileen could give you more detail, convener, on, on the status of the report itself. Um, thank you, Convener. Um, the draft Isla Goose Management Strategy uh, is in its second draft version at the moment, and it's on our website and available for um, download at, at the moment, so we can certainly pass on the link to uh, the committee. Um, this is the, the second version. The first version was circulated to all the key stakeholders, which included RSPB, WWT and, and NFUS and so on, and we've had um, some very constructive comments from a number of those parties, and we've tried to take them on board in the second draft, which is available now. Um, we had a meeting of the National Goose Management Review Group yesterday when all those parties were around the table, and we spent over an hour uh, discussing the management strategy then. Um, there's also been, obviously, uh, discussions and meetings on Isla, and there was an open meeting two nights ago where people were invited. Uh, there were notices all around the island, and people were invited to come and discuss the strategy, and, and we're seeking um, as wide input as, as we can get. Uh, it's quite a lengthy document. It runs to about 70 pages, so obviously there's, there's quite a lot in there, but we are trying to, to, to address all of the issues around and geese and ensure that you know, the conservation status is at the heart of it, but obviously to try and do what we can to find a sustainable solution which um, also you know, reduces the impact on, on the farming activity. It's a very live, uh, on ongoing piece of work. Okay. Uh, do you want to come in at this point, Alec? Yeah. Yeah. If, yeah, if that's all right with you, um, this we're going to raise this later, but it, we've, we've got there already. So. Um, I, I wonder if, just to follow on from that, one of the concerns that was raised with us in our stakeholder meeting was um, obviously we're talking about migratory species so other countries are involved and I just wondered whether anybody could comment on what discussions have taken place um, with countries such as Greenland and Iceland and indeed with the European Commission given that uh, many of them will be affected in the life cycle of these species. Uh, certainly uh, Mr Ferguson we, we are aware we have um, uh, an obligation to consult countries like Ireland where there's a significant issue uh, with uh, migratory species like barnacles, um, Iceland, Greenland, and uh, forgive me, with one other? Uh, Netherlands. And the Netherlands. Um, we have written to all of these uh, administrations outlining uh, our emerging approach and inviting them to give feedback. Uh, I believe there's been some informal discussion with the Irish uh, uh, officials, not minister to minister, but with officials, um, but we haven't yet had formal feedback from Ireland on their position and, and the implications, but um, it's something clearly. Sorry, Minister, we, we, we've written to the Netherlands and we intend to write to uh, 
the public environment. Okay, so, yeah, so we, we have um, yeah. from it. If you want, you know, okay. yeah. for the points you make so that we can all hear it. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, uh, in case you didn't pick that up, Andrew was saying that we haven't uh, yet formally written to the Irish, but we have written to the Netherlands, but we can get, get uh, further information on that. But certainly, we need to engage with um, these governments because uh, the very high share we have of the global population, um, because of the implications it will have uh, for, for their own uh, biodiversity objectives in their own countries and it's just uh, you know it's the responsible thing to do before we, we step forward we want we obviously want to speak to the Commission on the basis of having consulted our our near neighbors about the implications for them and to demonstrate that we have tried everything we can other than uh, uh, adaptive management to to manage the problem can I just sort of get Final clarification, just to put the concern that was raised with us hopefully to bed. Um, I take it that where possible, you would take any representations made from these other countries uh, in, into consideration when finally approving the plan that's being worked on? Absolutely. I mean, the, the intent is to, to get their genuine feedback and, and uh, obviously if they have any concerns, we need to try and address those concerns about the approach. Uh, it will also help us understand what measures they are taking in their own country, perhaps there may be measures that are being taken in Ireland that could be useful to us. Uh, so it's a, almost a fact-finding element to it as well. Um, Graham Day, a supplementary on this. Yeah, if, if, if I may convene, just to, to try and clarify something. When we talk about migratory species, inevitably it seems that their behaviour has been altered at times by the impact of climate change. I just wonder if there's been any work done to determine uh, how the numbers that we're seeing are being impacted upon by climate change and the behaviour, maybe patterns may be changing, and if so, have we got any indication as to whether that will lead to an increase in numbers going forward or a decrease? Uh, certainly, I gut feel, and it is purely gut feel, I don't have any empirical evidence to, to, to back this up, but I would certainly invite um, Eileen and, uh, and Andrew to comment if they feel they've got further evidence that is that, cl that climate change will be having an impact and that it's changing weather patterns and therefore the uh, migratory patterns of geese may well be affected. Uh, whether that means this is a kind of a long-term trend that will continue to grow, I don't know. Uh, but uh, there's certainly some suggestion in the case of Orkney that that has been a contributing factor to the substantial growth uh, in uh, resident population of geese that were staying in Orkney you know, year-round, uh, which is why we've targeted our action at the resident population and avoid shooting during periods when migratory geese are visiting Orkney. Uh, so it's quite tightly defined. So we know we're only hitting the resident population there to try and bring them back down to something like the, the levels they used to be. But there's a huge expansion. I think they went from a few thousand uh, very quickly up to 20,000. And that, you know, all year round impact on agricultural land uh, and, and given the importance of the beef, the beef uh, herd in, in, in Orkney uh, and uh, you know, grazing land for the viability of the farming community there, uh, it was felt absolutely essential we take some action. So gut feel, I do think climate change is having an impact. How we monitor that, I guess we obviously have, uh, you know, we're developing our research programme uh, as a government and uh, obviously groups like Climate Exchange and, uh, and others are involved in looking at the impact of climate change on Scotland. Uh, but, you know, the SRUC and others, we could potentially uh, ask to look at this issue, but maybe Eileen would want to comment on what research we are doing on impact of climate change in this area. Um, yes, thank you. Um, there is quite a lot of work going on um, looking at populations and population, population trends. Um, Wildlife and Wetlands Trust do work for us and, and have an annual contract to monitor, uh, keep tabs of the numbers trends both in this country and overseas. So we do have that very good data and we can do analysis of how that's changing in relation to, to climate changes. Um, we're also undertaking more uh, tagging of, of birds as well and ringing of birds to try and see if there's any change to movements and, and behaviours um, within the UK. So I think it's an area of active investigation uh, and something we should continue to, to focus on. Uh, Nigel Dunn. You know, I, I, I suspect you've gone most of where I was hoping you would get me, but I guess my question is, are we seeing trends, and I think we are, which suggest that in many ways this is a global issue uh, and that what the Scottish Government is doing, clearly we have territorial responsibility, but, but, but the, these birds are responding to, to global weather patterns. And, and, and really, the Scottish Government and all of us have to be informed by a global model of where birds are going to go, because it might just be that over the next 10 years, these populations will shift themselves, and shooting them now is actually irrelevant. Uh, 
Well, uh, clearly it's one of the things we, we have to be very, very mindful of is the conservation status, status of a, you know, as a globally important species. And while I think the migration in this case is, is maybe on a regional level, if you take sort of, you know, Northern Hemisphere, if you like, the, the uh, rather than entirely global population, um, uh, we, the, one of the problems we have in identifying whether it's climate change or, or another factor is we don't know what's happening to the geese uh, when they're at the other end of their range up in, up in Greenland. And um, clearly there's a huge climatic change happening there. Uh, uh, but to the extent to which that's actually driving the change in population levels uh, and migratory patterns is, is hard to tell. But that we, you're absolutely right, Mr Don, we have to work with our international partners because this is not just an issue that affects Scotland. We have a responsibility uh, to, to a species which they probably value very much in their own countries. Uh, and therefore, we have, to, we have to be very mindful of that and make sure that nothing we do jeopardises the the f global future of, of the species. So we have to tread very, very carefully in taking forward any adaptive management approach to make sure that it's sensitive to that issue while trying to do what we can to alleviate the problem, which is clearly being felt at local level in places like Isla. We try and move on about management methods now. Um, uh, do you consider that the shooting of barnacle geese in Isla uh, is compliant with the birds directive? Uh, and we've had a corrective uh, from uh, the RSPB about the interpretation of the way in which the, um, the, the court case was actually dealt with um, because we understand the detail of that. We don't need to go into the detail of it as such, but are you happy with the compliance issue? Well, I, I, think, I think this is where it's key. I mean, we, we talked earlier on about the, the detailed work that goes into understanding exactly what's happening in Isla in terms of the, the bag limit and how it operates and how many birds are actually uh, you know, killed in, in terms of the lethal, lethal scaring, uh, because it's, it's crucial we're able to, to have the monitoring data to be able to back up our, our claims to, to Europe that we're not jeopardising the conservation status of the, of the species, and that we know precisely how many have been taken, how many are, are still there, and the proportion uh, in terms of the viable population uh, to ensure its future as a species uh, that, we are, that we are taking. So if, for example, um, you know, it, it transpires that we can confirm that the numbers have fallen this year, then we have to look seriously at is the limit we have set for the current year too high in that context? Because if it's having a detrimental impact on the population, we have to be very mindful of that. Uh, you know, in an ideal world, we would have perhaps a, a more dispersed pattern of, of barnacle geese. Uh, we, are, we are unlucky, or the people of Isla are very unlucky. Lucky in many ways, because they're a tremendous spectacle, and I, I understand they're very attractive to tourism. Um, but at the same time, unlucky from the point of view of the farmers in that the, it's hitting their best, the best quality land. So we have to help them manage that situation, but be very, very mindful that we need good quality data, which I think is one of the issues that came out of the previous court case about the ability to monitor and record and ensure that the bag limits aren't being exceeded uh, is, is absolutely crucial. So we put a lot of effort in, as, as Eileen Stewart and, and Andrew have explained, to making sure that takes place. And talking about controlling the geese, you know, uh, short of shooting them, um, are there other methods? Uh, that, because the question of scaring has been, you know, questioned about the displacement effect. Um, so what can you say about uh, that to us just now? Well, what, what uh, appears to be the case when you have non-lethal methods is that they are effective for a short period. Uh, but then the, the birds are intelligent, they adapt, and as I've explained, there are particular species that seem to be particularly adaptable. Uh, so that the, the, there's only a short-term benefit from that activity, unfortunately, uh, would that it were otherwise. Uh, I've seen for myself, when I visited Isla, some scaring activity being conducted while we were visiting one of the farms. We could see a neighbouring field where the, the geese were being moved on uh, with lethal scaring, and they flew about approximately about half a mile and dropped down in another field. So I think there is a, there's a challenge there. There's relatively limited amount of very good quality agricultural land in Isla, which is uh, highly important for the livestock industry there. And uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, you're just moving the, the geese, two and a half, three and a half thousand of them at one go from one field to another. Uh, and so you're just merely moving the problem, displacing it around the island. And it's even more complex, as I said earlier, in places like Orkney, where perhaps you're displacing them from one island to another. And then there's maybe not a similar level of scaring activity going on that island, and therefore they, they start to hammer those, those fields. So uh, we have to be very, very 
uh, conscious of the fact that we need to try every method that we can, short of uh, lethal action, uh, but at the same time, it, it clearly doesn't seem to work in the longer term. So hence why we've challenged uh, uh, other stakeholders to come forward with ideas that might help us. Are there other long-term approaches? Uh, the point that Eileen Stewart made earlier on about separating off geese, different species, so we can maybe help the Greenland white fronts by giving them more of the habitat they prefer. Uh, and, and then uh, take more decisive action in terms of managing the, the, the barnacle geese problem. Um, I know this may be a bit left field, but it's been suggested that cannon netting of geese uh, before they're dispatched uh, could possibly be a method that was used if you're confident that you're able to separate out the different species of geese. Is this something which has been tried? Uh, if I can maybe bring in Eileen Stewart on that one, uh, convener. Um, I don't know what that is. Well, maybe Andrew Taylor, sorry, would be. It's, uh, it is done. It's done uh, under licence, usually to uh, ring birds, to, to capture them and ring them, then release them. Uh, if, if this was done in the context of controlling uh, uh, geese, obviously, it would then need to be dispatched in some compliant method. But it would need to be done under licence. Yeah. OK. Um, Graham Day. Uh, uh, yes. I speaking to the, share, to the stakeholders previously and also when like, most of us at the Royal Highland Show and conversations strayed into the, onto this issue, uh, there's a general recognition that, that geese are actually quite hard to shoot. Uh, I just wondered what training, if any, is, is offered to ensure that any shooting that takes place is effective and, and what training, if any, is offered to the farming community in a general sense for goose control. Well, it's certainly a very important issue, and we've, we've actually encountered uh, difficulties in Orkney, as I, I believe committee members are probably aware, with uh, use of non-lead shot being insufficient weight to actually take down a goose and, and avoid injuring the goose and allowing it to, to live on, and obviously the welfare implications of, of, of not actually killing the goose outright. So um, there is a bit of a challenge, and ORSPB are concerned about use of lead shot, and uh, we are trying to work very uh, closely with Basque, uh, to support uh, the use of non-lead alternatives. Uh, bismuth, I believe, I'm not a, a shooting expert myself, but I believe um, bismuth is the one that's being trialled. Uh, but obviously, clearly taking uh, advice, and I believe Basque are involved in helping, trying to train or give people advice about uh, how, to, how to target uh, geese. But uh, perhaps ask Andrew if he's got any further information on that, which might be helpful to the committee. Well, uh, some, some shooting is done through employed marksmen who are obviously uh, professional, and they are... Uh, they, know, they know what they're doing. In some of the schemes, there are volunteer shooters uh, using shotguns, and uh, they tend to be uh, keen shooters anyway. As we said, we've had uh, uh, workshops with, with Basque in some of the island areas to, to support this as well. Okay. Uh, Jim Hume about netting, I think. Yeah. So to, just to clarify on the netting, I asked a question last week about netting and uh, if that was a possibility. We were told from some of the witnesses that netting was illegal. Um, could you clarify the, the situation, whether it is illegal or, or, or not illegal, or is it under special well, circumstances? I well, I understand it, it would be illegal unless it's done under licence. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I, I understand it's used largely to capture birds, to um, ring them, and, but you and then release them. But you mentioned, uh, uh, through the convener obviously, you mentioned uh, in your remarks that uh, about dispatching them as well, I presume you mean uh, If, if it was to be done in, in the context of control, mm -hmm. they would need to be, uh, having caught them, you would then need to dispatch them in some way. So there are licences that are happening at the moment for netting, it, it, not just for ringing, but also for dispatching the it's, bird? It's not done in, in this country. I believe they've done it in Netherlands. It's, so is it, an op is it a potential option? I, I understand. I mean, I think they gas them uh, mm -hmm. in the Netherlands. OK, thanks. Graham Dave, well, supplementary. Well, don't gas geese in Scotland. Well, <laughs> <laughs> uh, perhaps more humane note, one of the th topics that we discussed previously on the committee was the possibility of introducing contraceptive into feed, which is a, a tactic that's been used in Venice to deal with the pigeons, and it was suggested to us that that, that was not particularly a road that we would want to go down. But I wonder if in the context perhaps of Orkney, a risk straying away from Iowa, Tempt Rally, where there is a huge concentration of a particular species, whether that's an option there. Well, I think, I think the, the 
problem we would have in any, I mean, I, I understand the, the, the potential value of that uh, approach. Uh, the problem we have is because it's indiscriminate, potentially, uh, other conservation species or high conservation species could be captured, whether it's other type of goose, in the case of green and white fronts, perhaps in other island areas, or it may be another uh, bird altogether, uh, which, which would have a high conservation value, and therefore we could have uh, the risk that we could damage our conservation objectives in, in other respects. So uh, while I understand the, 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 you know, the, the potential effectiveness of it, uh, we would be, have a concern that we would pick up other species that would be potentially damaging effects on. And obviously, if we did it in Isla, the main concern would be green and white fronts and the potential, therefore, to, to cause serious problems for an already threatened population. I do, do accept the principle, but it would just be difficult to I mean, implement I totally accept that argument in relation to Isla, but I wondered if in Orkney it might be a more viable option given the concentration of one species there. That was, that was well, uh, if I may, I'll maybe uh, invite uh, maybe Eileen, would it be appropriate just to comment on Orkney, whether there are those risks in Orkney? I think, um, again, it, it's, it's something of a possible long-term option. Um, certainly at, at the moment we're not aware of any um, work on that area and, and as the uh, Minister said, there are issues of how most of these things, it's more to do with how you would administer them in a, in a safe and humane way is as much of an issue and, and you know, avoid the indiscriminate kind of impacts as, as developing the actual contraception. So I don't think it's, it's certainly a, a short-term measure that is, is likely to be useful to us. Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Convener. Uh, Minister, just to take us back to the issue of the lead shot, which you highlighted in relation to the weight of the shot and the fatality uh, issue. Um, I understand that there's new evidence or, or new recommendations from the Food Standards Agency on the toxicity of lead shot. And uh, if I'm right, I think that at the moment it's illegal to um, use lead shot on wetlands, but not on terrestrial. Um, ground. So I'm wondering about the implications for that and um, there has been advice from the Food Standards Agency as you'll know about the, um, the dangers of eating too much um, game that has been shot with lead shot. So I'm wondering if, if you've got any um, Scottish Government ev evidence you could highlight for us on that issue and whether, whether there is a view being formulated on it. Well, certainly, just to confirm, it's my understanding that, that uh, just for the record, that the lead shot is not being used over wetlands. I think specifically that's one of the training issues that, that you know, has been taken forward. Um, clearly, there would be a, uh, potentially any health uh, concerns would be something they need to take into account of in terms of scheme and also resale of carcasses clearly would be an issue in that situation. Uh, if I can maybe convene with your permission, ask Andrew uh, just to comment on the the detail there in terms of what we're doing to manage that issue at a local level? Uh, uh, indeed. Um, I mean, for example, in the Orkney scheme, there's no uh, lead shot being supplied uh, through the scheme and uh, the, the, the shooting does not take place over, over wetlands and it's done over stubble. So there's no uh, issue there of uh, shooting over wetlands. Um, I understand there was advice, uh, precautionary advice from the Food Standards Agency Scotland a couple of years ago about uh, uh, you know, excess consumption of lead shot game uh, for pregnant women and young children, I think. Uh, and and you know, this, the scheme would take account in the marketing of, of wild goose meat of any labelling requirements there were there. Thank you. I understand from uh, from my uh, the evidence that we've been given that the, there is new um, uh, advice from Food Standards Agency about consumers more broadly than the uh, the two groups that you identify in terms of um, eating less. And I'm just wondering what whether the Scottish government is um, addressing that issue. We can certainly convene if it'd be helpful. We'll look at the advice that's been been issued and come back to committee with any thoughts on whether it has implications for the existing scheme. But um, if that would be helpful to to the committee, uh, I mean, the, the, there is a UK group, the Lead Ammunition Group, is looking at this issue in some detail, and it, I do understand it's due to report in uh, a couple of months. We'll, we'll look forward to getting that. Apart from anything else, lead shot breaks your teeth. Um, and uh, we can move on to markets for geese watching, shooting, and so on. Jim Hume. Yeah, thanks. There's a, a, a two or three bits of uh, questioning here, and good morning to you all. Um, we heard about 
goose shooting on Orkneys and other areas and looking for different markets, etc. Uh, but also, perhaps, uh, there's a bit of a clash between sporting uh, shooting, obviously, uh, and uh, professional controllers. Uh, I just wondered if there's anything within the licensing arrangements that could help to address that. If I, if I may, can we uh, probably have to defer to, to Andrew mm -hmm. Taylor in that level of detail? Uh, well, I mean, clearly sp sport shooting makes a contribution to uh, controlling geese and as well as benefits to a local economy through that, the, uh, tourism. Uh, I mean, sport shooting would take part in... Uh, would take place in the op open season, whereas licences uh, w would be in the closed season. Okay, so, so, so there wouldn't, wouldn't be the case that because um, the licensing in the in, in the closed, sorry, in the open season, to get this right, that they're there for the sports uh, shooters. Uh, are you suggesting that the the closed, the controllers uh, aren't able to shoot when the actual sporting season is? Uh, I mean, yes, in, in, for example, in Orkney, the scheme does overlap. It comes into the shootings in, it does come into September, it does overlap uh, an extent. Uh, I mean, the, 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 attaining the, the, the take in Orkney, for example, does rely on both the, the efforts through the adaptive management pilot and uh, the uh, sport intake is an important part of that, and you have to take that into account through getting their bag returns and counting towards the, the uh, target uh, take. I think Vera uh, Eileen Stewart wants to contribute to this, if that's possible. Um, it, it, just to reassure you that, that all of the local pilots are working very closely with the sporting um, shooting groups in, in these various different areas and very much the adaptive management work is trying to add on and support the sporting activity so as far as possible it would be great if the sport shooting was able to carry out the control and it you know, wouldn't require any eff extra effort so we don't want to displace that. What we're trying to do is focus additional effort particularly on Orkney when in the early part of the season under licence there isn't any sport shooting allowed during August uh, and July and August but that's when the crop damage is, is being suffered so the adaptive management work is focusing early on the year to try and reduce that impact but then the sport shooting is then coming in later in the year so they're very much acting in tandem and the local groups are ensuring that all of the numbers and data is being collected from all of those different parties so that we have a good overall picture of the numbers and, and can monitor and, and so on. So they are quite well dovetailed and, and we are, you know, very conscious of not wanting to uh, impact on the sporting activity. Another point. Did you, were you going to say something more on this uh, point? No, I, I know right, okay, there's a number of people. people right. Dave Thompson, Alec Ferguson and Nigel Don. No. Thank you, convener, and morning, uh, Minister, and Eileen, and, and, and Andrew. It's just to kind of follow on from the point that Jim was raising there and the, the conflict between sports shooting and shooting for, for other purposes um, and the, the sale of, of the geese, you know, into the, to the public and so on. I mean, we, we, we heard from uh, some witnesses uh, who were saying that <coughs> people, estates that are primarily... Um, looking at sport shooting um, can pose a problem in a sense because although a crofter has a right to shoot a deer if it's eating his crops or her crops um, they've no right to shoot the goose because the goose belongs to the estate and we, they would need permission <coughs> because of the sporting rights in relation to geese um, but if you look at uh, uh, community owned estates like Storis Uisht um, it's much easier to um, get an agreement, you know, to allow uh, crofters to deal with the geese uh, on, on their land. And there, is a, there does seem to be a conflict between these two things. I just wonder if we could comment a little bit on that. Well, I mean, I, and I, I'm aware there are potentially a number of different aspects of, uh, of, of, of this issue which relate to land tenure. Uh, one example would be, I suppose, if if you looked at the wildlife tourism aspect of it, I know there are obviously the agricultural holdings view seeking to, to um, deal with this situation, but there's little incentive for a tenant 
to, to invest perhaps in bunkhouse or, or accommodation to exploit that market opportunity if they're not going to get the value back from the investment they make. So there are some uh, you know, legal barriers sometimes that, that prevent that. But in terms of the actual sporting activity itself, uh, I can see how the, the, the point might arise that you, know, it would, you would need consent of, uh, of, the, of the, the landowner to obviously uh, shoot on the ground uh, if that wasn't part of the existing tenancy rights that you, you had. Um, what we need to do in terms of managing a number of species conflicts, not just geese, but there are similar issues with other species, um, is to try and make sure that, uh, that all those who are affected by, in a negative, potentially negative way, can also see the value of the species in a positive way and maximise the opportunity there might be, uh, in this case, to, if a tenant farmer or crofter, in this case, is, is suffering agricultural damage, and they can see no gain in it for themselves in terms of perhaps generating a sporting income, where there's a quarry species, I should stress, then um, you know, that, that limits the opportunity for them to be able to adjust to it and say, OK, I can, live with the, I can live with the geese being here because I'm getting something back from, from nature, having delivered uh, a large goose population to my area. Uh, so there is a challenge there, I think, and uh, something, we, you know, if, was, if the committee's got any, any evidence in that, I'd be happy to look at it. Ferguson. Um, Convener, I, I was interested in what um, Eileen Stewart was saying about the uh, involvement of the sporting um, sector, if I can call it that as well, but um, referring back to something that Dr Walton of RSPB said to us when we had the round table session, he said, um, I actually asked him about any suggestions on how we could increase the quality of scientific evidence that was available, and he came back very strongly in fact, he apologised for being fairly strong on the point, was his exact words. But he said, a lot of sport hunting of grey lags in Orkney goes on, but the gathering of data on hunting bags is exceedingly poor in Scotland compared with other countries. We have no idea how many geese are shot by people coming from places such as Italy on, on sport hunting visits. If, if we are to have the, the, the proper robust science that I would not argue needs to be behind any uh, scheme, adaptive or otherwise, do we not need to address that point somehow? If, if uh, may convene, I'll maybe address it, but I'll just briefly just say that, uh, for, for purposes of brevity, that clearly I understand the point that's being made. I, I agree that the more information we have on the population levels and indeed the amount of activity in a sporting sense that's undertaken, and therefore the reduction in population level uh, that's there, that will help us inform our, our policy, both government and indeed SNH. But maybe Eileen wants to comment on the, on the detail. Um, yes. Thank you. Um, uh, I mean, Paul, Paul's absolutely right. There isn't um, mandatory bag returns for all the sort of sport shooting, and that does mean that uh, in, in the global sense, we don't have that data on shooting effort, and, and that does make it a, a more difficult, complex picture to unravel. Uh, I think there's a distinction with the, the pilots that are being operated at a local level and, and with the island groups, because we have a relatively small number of people who are all contributing and providing data. Um, and we, are, we, we think there's a high level of um, consistency with the data they're providing and the models that we have, population viability models, so we can see what we expect the population to do and we can monitor what that would do with different levels of take. So at the moment, that is all suggesting that the data we're getting is very good from, from both the voluntary sport shooting and the adaptive management pilot. But I think that's why we've chosen to take forward those pilots in an island situation where we've got a reasonably um, coherent um, groups of people who work together, it does make it far more difficult to roll these things out on a, on a national level. Clarification. And Nigel Dunn. Thank you, Convener. I just wanted to come back on Eileen Stewart's comment that there was some management shooting ahead of the season. And I'm just wondering whether we could adapt the season so that you didn't have to pay people to do what they would otherwise pay you for the privilege of doing. Well, certainly, and, uh, I'll, I'll let Eileen come in on the direct point, but clearly where we have the situation in, in Orkney, it seems to be somewhat different from, from say, Isla uh, in terms of its impact. We have an established, as Andrew Taylor said, established community of people who sport shoot in, in, in Orkney already, and therefore you've got a considerable number of people who are, are willing to, to support the, the rollout of the adaptive management pilot, and therefore you're able to uh, reduce the cost of the, the management pilot as well, and obviously resale of carcasses helps uh, in that respect too. So we have got uh, more than one model, if you like, working in Scotland is the way I would put it in there for, so not only do you have to take account the seasons and different circumstances, but also we've got the deployment uh, situation is quite different 
in perhaps a small island where there might be a relatively small number of farmers that are getting hit very hard, uh, but there's no sporting community there to support them. And then we have to bring in uh, Basque uh, shooters and, and specialist marksmen maybe to help out, whereas already it's quite different. But in terms of the length of the season, I can maybe ask Eileen uh, Stewart just to comment on that. Um, it is something that has been, been proposed and has been given some preliminary um, discussion at the, at the national group uh, level. Um, and I think it's still something that's worthy of further consideration. Uh, obviously, the, the control through licensing allows us to be quite prescriptive about, about numbers and where and, and what's taken. But if um, the issue is, is you know, one that is better dealt with through changing licenses, then, then that's something that can be reviewed. So it's maybe something that we can think further about. Thank you. Okay. Um, Nigel Dawn. Sorry, Claudia Beamish. Yep. Keep up. Okay. <laughs> um, could I ask you, uh, just building on the questions about the hunting bag data, whether there, there's any um, prospect of Scottish Government looking at the possibility of more generally looking at bag data building on the pilots um, for um, beyond the islands? Well, I appreciate it. it the point made by, I, I mean, about the, the fact that islands are easier to monitor, perhaps, that whether, whether there's anything more generally being um, mooted. So you want to yeah, on that? actually, we've carried out some work um, on looking at uh, 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 developing a voluntary uh, system for uh, all huntable birds in Scotland, and we've, we've uh, worked with... Uh, Basque and GWCT to build on their current uh, game bag, you know, survey uh, systems, and so there's there's work being done on that, and we hope to develop that. Um, Jim Hume, yeah, just a final final sort of part on, on the market for for geese, etc. Evidence that the government to impose restrictions on. Sales of geese out with communities, especially out with islands, therefore, um, it seems un, uh, a bit odd that you wouldn't allow a sold geese to go onto the mainland. I just wonder why those restrictions are there and if the government would uh, actually consider looking at that again and uh, allow the, the, the sale of shot geese across, well, across Scotland or, or, or even further afield. I, I, I invite either Eileen or Andrew to correct me if I'm wrong about this, but I believe there has been um, actually an area of consensus between the sports shooting community, Basque, and indeed the conservation groups like RSPB uh, and WWT in the past that actually there needed to be a ban on commercial sale of species for conservation reasons, uh, because there was a concern that there was uh, over-exploitation of the resource in the past, and as I've said, we got down to a point where some species were at very low levels and were in danger of, of, um, of, of facing serious challenge to their viability in Scotland. So the current ban was imposed as a conservation measure uh, to remove this, if you like, uh, kind of moral hazard almost of, of commercial exploitation of, of the goose species uh, for shooting and also would have potentially reduce the population that were needed for sports shooting as well, so the sports shooting activity, a bit like we have the challenge with salmon conservation. If the numbers get down to a level, sufficient level, then you, you start to risk the viability of the actual sporting activity itself. So um, SNH has used its powers to license uh, the limited sale of wild goose car carcasses arising from the trials on Orkney in the US, um, and only local sale is permitted uh, for a limited period of the trial in order to avoid the possibility of other geese being uh, illegally sold. Um, there would be a, an issue if, if you were trying to develop a market more generally and provide an employment opportunity perhaps in the islands. And I can understand the desire to do that clearly in uh, fragile uh, e economies where you're looking for new opportunities. You would, you would then have a challenge if you're marketing to mainland perhaps, there might be a sufficient demand, you wouldn't be able to guarantee a supply uh, and then there'd become a, a sort of a risk that you're, you're having to uh, perhaps push numbers harder than than, than they need to be pushed in order to maintain the guaranteed level of supply to, to fulfil contracts, etc. So I think there is a risk in kind of scaling up this activity and making it a commercial operation in a truest sense. If, uh, and, and really the, the desire was to introduce this to avoid an unnecessary waste of, you know, it's, it's sad that we have to, to uh, have lethal activity in relation to geese, which are a wonderful species here. Uh, and it was a desire to avoid that, that you know, carcasses going to landfill and being utterly wasted uh, 
we then uh, explored with the European Commission whether we'd be uh, able to do so. And indeed, if we do extend or offer to extend uh, this process to other areas where the adaptive management is being brought in, Lewis and Harris perhaps uh, elsewhere, we will need to seek permission from the Commission to do so. And it's on the understanding it is on a limited basis and it's not uh, a truly commercial operation. It's, it's just for local sale um, that we're able to achieve that. So we have to be very, very careful and, and bear that in mind in all cases. Is it perhaps a case that we're, we're past the stage where the, the geese are being overexploited, the population has got to a stage where it, it's unsustainable? Um, you, you sort of mentioned there that you couldn't supply all year round. Well, there's many other food substances which are, are seasonal, of course, and people don't expect to have geese all year round or strawberries all year round or whatever else? It's true. It's a slightly different situation, though. I mean, we have a situation where we have perhaps, uh, uh, through the adaptive management process, if we're doing it properly and we're monitoring the, the, the level of, uh, of the bag limit that's being taken and the impact in terms of the viability of the species each year annually, uh, there might come a time where we have to say, sorry, we can't shoot any this year. Um, and that's something we have to face up to, that you could create an industry around this and then suddenly tell them, Sorry, we're not allowed to kill any this year because the population is, uh, to pick up the point Mr Don made about international obligations and, and having to liaise with our neighbours and partners on, on the health, the conservation health of species, we could you know, have a, a situation where we're basically putting people into redundancy because we could no longer, uh, we could no longer exploit that, that, that commercial opportunity. Because we could be pu putting people into, into jobs of opportunity if, if we do allow... That, that is true, but I think uh, you, know, you, you would... It might be somewhat irresponsible uh, when we know, uh, as we've said this year, we've seen a substantial reduction in barnacle goose numbers. Okay, it's a different species and it's not the one we're talking about in Orkney, but there could come a time when we see a substantial reduction in grey lag numbers, perhaps because of climate change, as Mr Day said, or other factors out, uh, in other parts of the range where we'd be effectively responsible, SNH, Scottish Government saying, sorry, you're out of a job. Um, so we have to be very, very careful about this. And the primary purpose of having the sale of carcass was to avoid the unnecessary waste of a va valuable food resource at a time when uh, we're unfortunately having to take this action to reduce numbers in Orkney and elsewhere. But let's do it in a way that's not wasteful of that. You know, it's, it's a real shame if, if we're shooting these geese and their carcasses were going to waste uh, and not being used at a time when they could be used for local food. Um, that was the desire, rather than trying to create a new industry, which, which um, I could appreciate that if, if you had certainty of numbers and you could manage that over a period of time, you could build up an industry, but we're not in that position, I believe, at this stage. Do we have numbers or percentages of the amount of geese that are shot that actually go to the food chain or, and the geese that are shot that are actually... I, I'm not familiar with that level of detail. If I may, I maybe ask uh, Eileen Stewart, convener. Um, Yes, uh, at the moment the numbers have been relatively small, something like about a thousand geese from uh, Orkney have gone into the food chain. I don't have up-to-date um, figures from the US, but it's, it's a relatively small-scale activity at the moment, and so it was you know, felt to be probably more appropriate for, for it to be a local industry, and that was to some extent what some of the stakeholders were saying. They wanted this to be a, you know, local community initiatives to support local jobs and, and you know, give them another kind of asset on, on the island. So um, there is that element. And, and I think probably the other thing just to mention is that one of the other challenges would be if, if you open this more widely, it would be very difficult to distinguish between um, a grey lag goose breast and a, and a green and white front. So that's obviously one of the other risks that we want to avoid is, is um, you know, the wrong sorts of geese ending up in, in the food chain. So that's another thing that uh, we just need to be aware of. If I may convene, you see a, a hundred, a thousand, sorry, of the Orkney geese end up in the food chain, I presume that's per year. Do we know how many are, are actually shot all, altogether? In, in Orkney, uh, it's around about 5,000. So I think uh, at the moment it's sort of building up because obviously this is just a, a new initiative and so people have only just become licensed and so on. So I think we would expect it to grow a, a little bit, but it's, it's never going to be a, you know, a very mainstream activity, I don't think. It's, it's purely an anecdotal comment, uh, convener, but I was just recently in Orkney for the Islands Ministerial Working Group and was keen to explore whether goose burgers, which are now being produced, are on the market. And uh, it was actually quite difficult to find them. So I think it is, as Eileen Stewart said, still an emerging area. And, uh, you know, it's not necessarily, they don't appear in local restaurants in great numbers or uh, as a local resource. So that might be an opportunity locally to make something of it while it lasts. 
um, to to um, to maybe market it to local tourists as a as a as a, a, a unique product in a Scottish context. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Thanks. Dave Thompson. Thank you, Convener, uh, Minister. Um, I, I'm just wondering if you could elaborate a little bit, because I'm, I'm slightly confused about why restricting the, the market, the sale of them to Orkney, as opposed to allowing the folk who are processing them and, and producing the burgers, or and indeed you could have goose patty as well, and that, that would keep as, as well. Once you've got it into a, into a jar, it doesn't have a shelf life uh, that's very short. Um, Surely the control would be over those who are allowed, who are licensed to shoot them, and those who could be licensed to process them. Uh, the actual market, uh, restricting it to Orkney or Uist, I don't see how that actually affects the numbers short. If you control the, the shooting and the processing, is that not enough, surely? And then that would allow them to build their market a bit more widely, because I mean, the, the grey lag, there's lots of them. Yeah, that might change in the future. But if we're monitoring it closely, we're going to see that change beginning to happen. So licence conditions could then be tweaked. So instead of someone being able to shoot 1,000 a year, they might just be able to shoot 500. So we would have the ability to, you know, deal with it through the licensing. Um, because I'd, I'd, I'd be really keen to try to create jobs in US, for instance, you know, uh, local folk who could set up a processing um, uh, business, uh, as I say, doing, doing burgers or, or doing something like patty that's got a longer life. Uh, so I'm just wondering if you could comment on that. Well, uh, I, I certainly sympathise with the, the points that, that Mr Thompson expressed. I mean, clearly, if, if there were um, no concerns that we had about either the stakeholder views. We've got to work very carefully with our stakeholders on this, as I'm sure the um, committee will appreciate, uh, and only take them as far and as fast as we can. Um, we have to have confidence in a number of points that were raised earlier on about understanding Mr Ferguson and understanding exactly how many are being shot, uh, what their impact is on the, on the population level. Uh, so there's all the, the backdrop, if you like, of having to be very clear about what is actually happening on the ground in terms of uh, the uh, adaptive management process, how many are being taken, and give confidence to stakeholders and the Commission that we are managing this effectively, they can trust the data they're seeing, that there is no risk to the conservation health of the, of the species. And it may well be in time that you can get to a position where you have a, a regular um, uh, adaptive management pattern that, that you, and, and the stability of the population is such you know exactly how to do that, and that might give a more favourable climate for the employer, in this case, to, to establish a business. But all we're saying is there's a risk at the moment there. We could end up in a situation where we're working one year to the next at the moment in terms of population numbers, and we might have to draw a line and say, sorry, this year there's no, there's no shooting activity at all, because some calamity, perhaps weather-related, might have devastated the, the, the flock elsewhere or here. And we have to be very mindful of that. We then have to do everything possible to help the geese boost their, their breeding numbers to sustain the future. So we could have to put things into reverse in some respect. So I'm just conscious that there's that aspect. The conservation issue is underpinning all of the concerns we have about, let's tread very carefully here. We're just, this is, we're just exploring this issue for the first time in some years. And we need to be very careful about how we, we progress. But I do understand the point that's been made. If you could generate long-term sustainable jobs out of this without risking the conservation status of the species, then I think that would be a, a useful outcome in the sense that, you know, we clearly, the allowing the sale of the carcasses does allow those who are helping support the process to get something back from, from this in terms of uh, sustaining the cost of shooting and, and, and undertaking the control work. So... Uh, you know, it would help sort of recycle some money back into into the management process, uh, but we just have to be very careful about how we we tread and, and keeping the market tight at this stage. Was felt for the reasons that, that Eileen gave, um, you know, a, a means by which we could uh, manage, understand exactly what's happening, be able to show an audit trail almost of of what's going on in terms of the sale of the carcasses and, and what they're being used for. Uh, and I have in mind that you know you would potentially have a risk of um, not being able to sustain the, the level of activity needed to support a, a bigger contract, you know, where you were maybe selling to thousands of customers in the mainline. We are talking about a thousand geese at the moment and 
that would hardly scratch the surface of potential demand. Yeah, very briefly. Just a quick follow-up point. Um, we did hear a bit of evidence as well that uh, some, some crofters in particular are thinking about stopping work on their crofts because the sheep are just decimating them. If they stop working their crops, then the stuff that the geese are eating disappears. Uh, then the, the geese don't have food and the geese die. Um, so the longer we take, you know, it sounds as if, yeah, we need to do more and get more evidence. You know, if people stop working their crofts, then you could have uh, repercussions from that. There's, the food isn't there for the geese and, and therefore you've got a problem. I, I wouldn't want this to drag out too long, you know. Absolutely. I mean, we, we are absolutely aware of the impact on farmers and crofters. I would stress, if we make a plea through the committee, um, it's just an observation that we've had in the last four years. Um, I think only twice have the Crofting Federation attended National Goose Management Review Group meetings. Uh, and indeed, we had one yesterday, which they were unable to attend. So, you know, we need better engagement from... Conferencing? <laughs> well, video conferencing? We, we have off offered that, and indeed they can dial in to the meetings, but we, we don't have regular engagement. I would really strongly encourage the great regret there hasn't been that degree of involvement in the National Goose uh, Management Review Group in the way that the NFUS, uh, Basque, SLE, RSPB, and others are very actively involved. So yeah. if there are... If All there are these other bodies live close to Edinburgh. And, you know, I mean, we're talking about real difficulties for people who actually require to be at meetings uh, of this sort. And well, I would make a plea that we find a way to do that. Well, th that has been offered, Convener. I, I have offered video conferencing to, to the Crofting Federation for that reason. But I understand individuals involved actually live quite close to Edinburgh. So it's not necessarily a barrier to attending meetings in Edinburgh. But, you know, we, we have um, a need for, for the, and I've written on this basis to, to, I believe, in the past to... to, to uh, uh, Crossing Federation to ask them to please to participate in, in these meetings. But assuming that can happen, we will get a better understanding of these precisely these kind of implications because I want to understand as best I can how we can help crofters in this situation. Uh, clearly, the, the pilots are designed to help in some of the particularly strong crofting areas, but if there are other areas that we're not covering in the pilots, then obviously I would invite the committee and indeed members who've got a close crofting interest like Mr. Thompson to let me know and then we can take that on board. Thanks for that. Um, I think we'll try and move on to other government actions which Cara Hilton wants to lead on just now. Yeah, thanks, convener. Um, good morning, Minister and panel. Um, a key issue that was sort of discussed at the stakeholder roundtable last week, and which you've already touched on yourself, was the balance between um, conserving um, geese populations and obviously the right of crofters to uh, work their crofts. So can I ask um, how the government can help to strike this delicate balance, especially given the spending constraints uh, for the goose management schemes is more limited and indeed in some cases has been cut quite significantly. <coughs> well, um, it's indeed a very important area, as, as Mr Thompson was also highlighting, that we need to uh, work closely with crofters. I appreciate that many crofters struggle, uh, those that are trying to make a living from, from crofting uh, full time, you know, really struggle as it is. Uh, and clearly many others aren't, don't generate sufficient income from crofting to, to generate a living, so they're having to work in other areas as well. So, they may be also constrained in terms of the time they can spend in, in managing an issue where there's geese uh, presenting themselves on their croft. So it's clearly a, an important issue. Uh, I touched upon it in the, the outset that there, you know, certainly the thinking at the moment is the SRTP isn't necessarily the right vehicle to deliver additional support, but um, I am keen to explore to what extent we can help. There is some funding available, for example, for cooperative working through SRDP. And it was really just an idea we were discussing earlier on that we can explore, so I apologise to the committee. I haven't uh, done much thinking on this in detail, but um, it might be possible for us crofters collaboratively to find uh, a way at a local level to, to manage a problem where it's presenting at an area level, uh, either to find land that could be used on a sacrificial basis, that could be used to feed the geese effectively and take pressure off the, the remaining uh, uh, grazing land they have uh, or, or some other method to try and get them to encourage them to collaborate. So we'll have a little uh, investigation as to whether there's other parts of SRDP that can support in this case. But I would say that we have, um, while there was, it's true that we had a review which suggested that we, uh, to some extent, uh, reduce some activity in certain areas and focus on green and white front geese uh, for the reason we discussed earlier, that their conservation uh, status is, is much weaker. 
Um, we have, in the course of the discussion, engagement with stakeholders in Isla, increased the budget again to back to almost where it was uh, previously. So they're now up to £910,000 they get in 2013-14. And we still to have discussions with them about what we do in the current financial year uh, in terms of the final outturn. Uh, so we have responded. Um, you know, so the budget, in, where there has been evidence of pressure, has gone back up. Uh, so the, the spend per goose, if I can call it that, is, um, is almost at a record level now. Um, so back up to almost £20, or £19.50, I believe, per, per goose actually on the island. Uh, so not the ones that we're shooting, but just the, the, the number of geese is 46,500 geese in Isla. Um, and, uh, you know, we're spending significant sums of money. So I think, um, you know, it's not true to say, I know the petition sets out that, that, that funding has been cut uh, or stopped. Uh, that's not true. Um, there is an issue with the Macker Life project, which is maybe changing focus. So we're now doing adaptive management and funding it through direct funding from SNH rather than through Macker Life. Um, and the budget is slightly higher, but it does take in, it's not a like for like comparison. There are other things in the budget that SNH are paying now, which you know, sort of goes beyond what was in the Macker Life project. So it's not a strictly speaking a comparison, but the funding is now slightly higher uh, there too. So uh, there is still funding there. We take it very seriously. The budget is. £1.2 million, pounds, which is not insignificant at a time of budgetary pressure. And we are trying to respond where there's clear evidence, as there was in Isla, of, of significant damage. Uh, and uh, while we try and find a longer term solution, because it's arguable that the, the continuing to fund in the way we are isn't necessarily a sustainable solution in itself. So we need to find a way of, 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 of helping the crofters and farmers uh, help themselves in many cases, but also uh, provide them with uh, support that doesn't grow the problem. Because um, literally we're feeding grass to basically feed geese, and that's, uh, that, is, that is creating a problem where more geese are being attracted to those very well fertilised and, and seeded fields. Yeah, just, I mean, it's a follow-up in respect <coughs> to the adaptive, adaptive management schemes. Can I ask if there are actual targets in place um, to reduce the goose numbers, and if so, how are these uh, determined, monitored and assessed? Well, the, the, certainly in the case of Orkney, uh, because it's a quarry species, the, the um, uh, grey lag, we, we set about a bag limit of 5,000 to specifically reduce the resident population over a period of time back down to where it used to be, about three or 4,000 uh, resident geese. It's now re it had reached 20,000 and rising, uh, and with a growing migratory population as well, for the reasons I, I was discussing with Mr Day earlier, uh, that was compounding the problem. So we've, we've taken a specific figure there to try and reduce... Uh, with consultation with stakeholders, reduce the numbers down of resident geese while not affecting the migratory population. In the case of barnacle geese, uh, there have been views expressed to us by local farmers and, and uh, from Isla uh, that uh, the figure of, of less than 30,000 would be sustainable. Um, but we have to do a lot of work, obviously, to, uh, to establish what is a truly sustainable population uh, of barnacle geese numbers on, on Isla. Uh, and that figure is yet to be, yet to be uh, identified. But I don't know whether Eileen Stewart would briefly want to just comment on that. Um, yes, I mean, just to, to support what the Minister said, all, all of the pilots do have uh, target populations that they're aiming for, and those were developed um, uh, on the basis of sort of scientific data on what would be a sustainable population and, and, and trying to work out <coughs> what we actually looked at, the amount of improved grassland in these different areas and what they could potentially support without having an undue impact on agricultural activities and, and then there was a process of negotiation with local stakeholders to, to get a final agreed target and so um, each year an annual bag is, is agreed and, and so we're working towards those, those targets and, and monitoring to see whether progress is being made. I think for all of the pilots to date we haven't managed to achieve the shooting levels that we've set so actually you know that that is one of the biggest challenges to get um sufficient activity to to maintain that sort of downward trend but we are working with with local stakeholders to, to develop these models and, and these schemes thank you very much um angus mcdonald the macker life project etc <coughs> yeah thanks uh, convener P picking up on on your comments uh, minister regarding uh, the macker life project um we, we had some discussion about it last week um and you know, clearly it deals with the, the impact of, uh, of, of excessive grey lags on the, the crops on the macker. Um, now, the RSPB said that uh, it had been pressing for the project to continue, um, but funding uh, hadn't been found. And Paul Wal Walton of the RSPB said that SNH had offered to provide 40,000 of funding towards 
uh, a project to manage geese uh, to help conserve the traditional crop varieties, uh, but an additional 40,000 was required, and that's why the project hasn't gone forward. Um, you, you just mentioned uh, a couple of minutes ago about other action that has been taken to um, uh, take the place of the Macha Life project. Um, can you expand on that? Can you tell us uh, what other action is being undertaken and whether that is going to be as successful as the Macha Life project, which seemed to be working? Well, certainly, if I could say it out, uh, I recognise the, um, the valuable work that's been done in the Macher, through the Macher Life project and the, the habitat there is outstanding. It's first class in terms of its impact on um, biodiversity and <coughs> promoting the welfare of birds, but also uh, um, invertebrates as well, and particularly pollinators like bees. I think uh, it's fantastic. Uh, the funding that we are providing in 2014-15 uh, for the US, for example, is, uh, is £45,400, and uh, that is for 2014-15, uh, which is uh, you know, higher than the, the, the funding, I believe, uh, just under 40000 that was provided to, through Macro Life. Uh, but you're right, uh, Mr. McDonald, and it, it, you know it's a, it's a different it's a different basis point I was making to Cara Hilton as well that it's uh, funded on a slightly different basis. And obviously, this is about adaptive management, so it's specifically about managing uh, the difficulties we have with geese, uh, rather than um, a wider project looking at a habitat uh, in the case of macro life. Um, <clears throat> the original macro life project also involved EU, RSPB, SNH and the local authority in this case for, for, ran for four years and it was to promote biodiversity of ground nesting birds so hence the different focus uh, in this case. Uh, goose management did form part of the project um, and included goose scaring for the purposes of crop protection of traditional cereals uh, which in turn provided a, a habitat for the birds such as a corn bunting in particular which was, we've had some great success with. Uh, the goose management element on the use has now been carried out through the adaptive management trial uh, and furthermore since 2011 SNH have, um, has funded additional advisory support to enable crofters to access rural priorities options as well through SRDP uh, to provide funding and support traditional macro cultivation um, and so that potentially could continue under the, 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 the SRDP as a as, as uh, programmed in terms of the agri-environment, so we'll need to have a look at what the detail could be delivered on a similar basis to support the traditional cereal production, which obviously helps with the, the habitat for the corn bunting and other ground nesting birds, and obviously the greening measures that the Cabinet Secretary has announced in CAP as well uh, would equally apply in crofting areas to, to, to those uh, non-crofting areas. So we have a number of different tools that could be supplied. So I, I recognise the point RSPB made about the quantum of funding. Um, but there, you know, we're not just saying the adaptive management budget is the only thing that we're going to be spending in those areas. Uh, that's specifically targeted at goose management. Uh, but there are other funding pots through SRTP, through rural, uh, the equivalent of rural priorities funding, um, you know, to, to support the kind of traditional aspects of what crofters do. And indeed, I was discussing with Patrick Krause uh, at Royal Highland Show and Derek Flynn just what more I would like to do in terms of celebrating the high nature value far farming aspects of crofting and to, work, to, to build on that through SRDP to, and other measures to try and uh, support them in what they're doing, which would have the desired impacts that RSBB, I think, would want to see in, in protect, protecting the macro itself. So um, I, I guess it's something we need to evolve on, but I'm sure um, I would welcome any views that, that, that Mr MacDonald or others have on that. Is there a prospect of you going back or looking at uh, the Macro Life project in future years if... Uh, the, 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 the new systems don't quite get the results that you're hoping for? Well, I, I put it this way, I would be, I'd be very sorry if we saw um, uh, a deterioration in the, in the quality of what is an absolutely superb habitat. Uh, so I, I can give an assurance that I will keep an eye on the, on the, on the issue in terms of the prospects for, for the marker and um, work with, with colleagues in... Uh, in uh, obviously in the, in the agriculture team to, to, to develop SRDP which actually helps support that sort of uh, scheme but you know what we have to do is focus on the outcome we want and is macro life the, the, the right kind of project to do it if that is the case then then uh, I'm sympathetic but you know we, we have to focus on in this case we've got adaptive management we need to protect um, the livelihoods of the crofters and farmers from serious agricultural damage from geese 
Uh, at the same time, we've got our obligations under biodiversity uh, duties and, and our targets for 2020 to try and work with stakeholders such as crofters to protect what biodiversity we have uh, and enhance that if we can. Uh, and I'll give an undertaking to do that. But uh, Eileen may want to comment, Eileen Stewart, sorry, convener, may want to comment on uh, what other things we can do to support the projects. Um, yes, certainly. Um, I think it's just important to recognise that the, the Maca Life project is, 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 was a very good project, but it was very broad-based um, and obviously had the support of European funding, so, you know, was able to undertake a, a variety of works. So, and the purpose of those European Life projects is to trial new approaches to, you know, develop innovation and so on. And so what we are hoping with the Adaptive Management Pilot is, is effectively, it's an evolution. So we, we will take, you know, a lot of the successes and a lot of the mechanisms that we used in the Maca Life, but evolve it in a way that's sort of sustainable in the long term. So one of the approaches under the Maca Life um, project in relation to geese was was effectively non-lethal scaring by and large so you know it was scaring and, and obviously the geese are moving around the uh, crofting areas um, and as, as numbers get larger then obviously that task gets harder and harder so the adaptive management approach is is targeting um, a geese reduction so that uh, then, you know, the resulting population is more easy to manage and, and effectively crofters will be able to start taking uh, control of that themselves and, and there'll be a sort of uh, a more, a smaller problem to deal with at the end of it. So I think what we're doing is we're in a, we're in a process of transition to, to a new approach and we hope at the end of the adaptive management pilot that we have a much more manageable, um, you know, problem that we can deal with in, in the longer term without that degree of sort of funding support. So... We, we, we haven't stopped sort of the MACA. We've, we've evolved and, and many of the activities are maintained through this coming period. Um, but, and, and we obviously do review on an annual basis and we'll be able to amend if, if you know, problems emerge. Hey, thanks. I'm just picking up on your point regarding the, the, the larger numbers um, on, on use, yeah, the increasing numbers. Um, clearly, that's creating the overspill that's moving on to Lewis and, and Harris. Um, and the minister mentioned in his preamble the, 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 that work is uh, starting there this year. Um, is there a timescale for that? Uh, well, we, I believe that um, we're looking... Uh, well, places like Tyree, for example, it's another area that's affected to, to have a, uh, something in place for August and then uh, look to extend later on in the year. I believe Lewis and Harris are slightly later than that, but uh, maybe just invite Andrew to... Oh, so it's August as well. So uh, we'd hopefully be able to start the uh, adaptive management then. I mean, just for, for the record, I believe, we, while the figures aren't as uh, solid in terms of the population on, on UST, and obviously we want to firm up on that, we believe there's about 7,000 um, resident grey lag geese now on, on UST. So it's getting to be significant numbers uh, and on UST, yeah, and Bebecula. So it's a significant number of, of geese. Thank you. Uh, follow up on government <coughs> action from Graham Day. Uh, uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, come at this from a slightly different direction, Minister. We've talked about conservation of species, we've talked about to protecting farm incomes, we've talked about biodiversity. But it, it does strike me that if you've got tens of thousands of geese um, doing their business, as it were, on farmland, uh, that must have the potential to have a, an adverse impact on the natural environment both in terms of pollution and water courses and perhaps impact on other species. I think the ewes have been mentioned as a species that will be an, uh, an animal that's been impacted upon. I just wonder what information is available on this and whether th th this may be as much a reason to take action as the fact that the geese are damaging crops and impacting upon farm and crop, uh, farm and croft income and food production. Well, the, the two aspects of it, I can very briefly just mention the impact on other species first, because I think that's, that's also something you should note. Uh, the evidence I saw from Isla showed clear destruction of concrete corridors where geese had got in behind fences and just stripped the, the grass completely bare. So there are issues, certainly from the point of view of impact on other conservation priorities at a local level, which we have to factor in. Uh, but in terms of the impact on health and the wider environment of doing the business, as you politely put it, um, I think uh, it's a significant issue there. We are aware um, that it's not uncommon for, for uh, or not unknown, I should say, for um, uh, salmonella to be transmitted from geese to sheep. Um, 
but it's not thought to be common. So just to make the correct point, I picked that up incorrectly. Uh, and geese are, are not generally regarded as a reservoir of infection, but it, it's not unknown. So it's possible that there could be a, a transmission of salmonella from, from geese to, to, to sheep. Um, we are you know, aware, as I say, of some other impacts on biodiversity. Geese can be a source of infection, and obviously, clearly, where you have excrement of any kind involved, it can impact on water quality. Uh, although we're not aware this has necessarily been substantiated in Scotland, but it's obviously something, uh, if emergent, uh, evidence does emerge, that there's a localised impact, and clearly we would take that into account. Um, I know institutions like Mordun, for example, are looking at the impact of uh, livestock on uh, particularly you know, deer and, and cattle and sheep on, on water quality. They haven't to date, I believe, looked at geese in that respect, but it's something clearly where you have got a very concentrated number of geese somewhere like Isla or indeed Eus or, or Orkney. There, there could be an additional exacerbating factor that could cause problems with uh, water quality. So uh, certainly something we need to keep an eye on. Um, but we don't have a wealth of evidence in this area, but it's not unknown for, for salmonella to be transmitted to sheep. Thank you very much, uh, Minister. Um, we are happy to get you know, the evidence you've given us to put this in perspective. And, uh, of course, we'd like to write about this a bit further when we uh, reflect on what's been said. Um, it seems to me that uh, in terms of uh, the science that we're getting clearer ideas about uh, the numbers and why they're being distributed where they are. Uh, but in terms of the response, and in particular related to um, the response of uh, the quarry species, we're talking only about a seasonal cottage industry. We're not talking about major numbers. We're talking about um, the marketing of a small number of goose burgers. Um, we're also talking about small populations that couldn't possibly perhaps eat that number of goose burgers if they were seeking a choice of any sort in their diet. But uh, it would seem to me that you might want to think about this in terms of the total allowable catch approach which we have in fishing, whereby uh, local people could know what uh, number of geese could be processed in the following season on the basis of the up-to-date knowledge that you have. And that uh, we recognise that uh, perhaps the small abattoirs that exist for things like turkeys in the case of uh, one that I know of near Ullapool, uh, in the case of uh, other small abattoirs in uh, Harris and other places, that they might well be able to cope with the numbers concerned. So without you know, disparaging your remarks about creating an industry and then making people redundant, I think people are used to seasonal small cottage industries in that case. And therefore, if you're thinking about this in the way forward, I'd hope that you'd make sure that uh, we do see that as a perspective that could help uh, crofting income uh, in those areas. So um, finally, just to, to ask you uh, about this, we want to see everyone collaborating. We want to make sure that the crofting federations collaborating too. Noted, thank you very much. Um, but um, there's been quite a number of issues raised here, um, and those raised in the petition were specific to the crofting areas. But do you see this because there are different situations in the different localities that are affected as some means to create a national plan that takes into account a differentiated way forward? Well, well certainly, Convener, I, um, I uh, would regard it being important that we keep an eye on, a, while there may be local extenuating circumstances, local conditions that need to, to, to tweak schemes at a local level, uh, you know, so they're appropriate, that, that we need to have a mind that, that we have a consistency where that's appropriate uh, in approach, you know, so on a like-for-like -like basis, if the circumstances are similar, you try and, uh, and be fair and, and have a consistency uh, applied. That will obviously help in terms of demonstrating uh, what we are doing to the Commission, that we are dealing with things in a consistent way as well, and give clarity and transparency about what we're doing. I think we always have to be mindful there are local circumstances that may play, might actually be, uh, in many ways, in some cases, impossible for even a cottage industry to develop in certain locations just because of lack of uh, available skills or, or facilities, indeed. Um, I know there have been suggestions about mopping up the additional um, 
product, if I can call it that, from in Orkney and other places, using it for, for fish feed, for example, and other opportunities that have been presented. There are some technical issues there that apply because of, um, apologies, I have to read this out because it's, uh, it's transmissible spongiform encephalopathy, TSE, Scotland regulations, um, and the implications they have for processing animal uh, proteins into the food chain. Uh, and uh, there are certain prohibitions in place for, for using, say, poultry products, but because these are wild birds rather than poultry, there may be some, uh, some difference in ter interpretation that, that, that can apply. But even if there was uh, uh, no such prohibition on using poultry products in this way, um, the protein would have to be processed in an authorised feed plant. So there are some technical, and that requires a bit of investment and scaling up to, to be able to deliver that. So it's not as straightforward as it may seem. But I do take the point on board about needing to be uh, mindful of the opportunities that could arise for uh, a small-scale industry at a local level. But we just have to be careful that we bring our stakeholders with us in this. Uh, they have um, uh, you know, been supportive of this approach to date in terms of allowing the sale of carcasses. We, we have to be careful we don't push them too far uh, and uh, are faster than they're willing to go. Thank you very much for your evidence and I thank your officials as well because we've had an illuminating session and it will give us some thought about how we respond and keep uh, uh, decisions about this petition uh, and how we go forward uh, in the forefront of our minds. So, uh, uh, as we agreed earlier, we're going to move into private in a minute or two um, to deal with letters on uh, resource use and circular economy and the Land Reform Review Group final report. Um, the final meeting, this is the final meeting before the summer recess with the committee due back on the 6th of August. So with that in mind, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank everyone who's taken part in and organised uh, the committee meetings this year, uh, to ministerial teams, to witnesses and so on. It's been very helpful to us all. Your valued contributions have helped drive the work of the committee forward and it's a pleasure to be able to do so. So thank you very much and we'll now move into private.